Hello, and welcome to a new season of Things That Go Bump in the Night. This is J.C. Bratton coming to you from my Zen room on the border of San Jose and Campbell, California. So today's episode, I'm going to do a reflection piece on an article that I wrote back in March of 2021. It's about the top five final girls in slasher horror. I hope you'll enjoy it. In the meantime, I do have one big update regarding the things that go bump in the night pod drama. So we finally got most of it recorded and now I'm going through some final editing. So I'm pretty optimistic we'll be able to release sometime in October. So I'm really excited about it. I think it turned out really, really well. And thank you again to Floor 5 Theater Company for all your support and all your hard work in this. So kick back and relax. We'll be back soon with the top five final girls in slasher horror. I think it is. You know, I think it's her father. You know, why can't they find her pops, man? Because he's probably dead. His body will come popping up in the last reel somewhere. Eyes gouged out, fingers cut off, teeth knocked out. See, the police yeah. are always off track with this shit. If they watch prom night, they'd save time. There's a formula to it. A very simple formula. Everybody's a suspect. As Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson taught us ever so brilliantly in the Scream franchise, there is a basic formula in slasher horror. The person who ends up outsmarting the killer at the end is the studious young woman who, typically, avoids the sin factor of having sex, drinking, and using drugs. There is a name for this brave heroine, the final girl. Carol J. Clover's Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film, is where the final girl was officially coined. Nominated for the Bram Stoker Award for Best Nonfiction in 1992, the book takes a look at slasher horror from a feminist angle. The audience learns to root for a strong female who overcomes obstacles and ultimately outsmarts the sadistic, typically male, killer. In early slasher horror, the final girl though able to survive and figure it all out, still had to be rescued by a strong male counterpart, typically a police officer or some authority figure. A perfect example is Lila Crane, Marion Crane's sister in Psycho, 1960. She learns that Norma Bates is really a corpse and is about to be attacked by Norman Bates when Sam Loomis, Marion's boyfriend, helps to stop Norman ultimately saving Lila's life. Over time, however, the final girl has evolved to come into her own. For example, in the 1998 remake of Psycho, Lila's character helps take down Norman, which gives Lila less of a damsel in distress stigma. Setting aside the social commentary, we cannot help but to be excited for our strong-willed final girl and nervously keep our fingers crossed that she can survive the night. That said, let's take a deeper look at five of the best final girls in slasher horror and why we love them so much. Number five, Sydney Prescott in Scream. What's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Sydney fit the typical nice girl stereotype and wished her life was like a Meg Ryan rom-com. That said, it was clear she would be the final girl of the Scream franchise. However, what made Sydney even more interesting was the fact that she defied the rules of the slasher movie. If you recall, she ended up having sex with her boyfriend, Billy Loomis, yet she still survived. Number four, Nancy Thompson in A Nightmare on Elm Street. I know you too well now, Freddie. Sweet, innocent Nancy Thompson had all the makings of the good girl stereotype that keeps one alive in a slasher film. We're assuming she didn't have sex with her boyfriend, Glenn, played by Johnny Depp in his horror debut. She was so much more than the typical final girl. Coming from a home where her parents were divorced and her mom had an alcohol problem, Nancy was resilient and level-headed. She was determined to avenge her friend's death and defeat the infamous child murderer, Freddy Krueger. 
Naturally smart, Nancy studied Freddie and ultimately became a dream researcher, encouraging youths on how they can defeat Freddie. Number three, Ginny Field in Friday the 13th, part two. Jason! It's all done, Jason. You've done your job well and mommy is pleased. Ginny Field is the first on-screen final girl to defeat Jason. As you may recall from part two, Jason did not have his hockey mask yet. He was very much fresh from seeing his mom, Pamela, get her head sliced off by final girl Alice Hardy in part one. What makes Ginny stand out was that she used her training in child psychology to really get into Jason's head. She dressed in Pamela Voorhees' sweater and fooled Jason into thinking Pamela was alive. Her brilliance helped her to escape. Number two. Tina Shepard in Friday the 13th, Part 7. Jason is back, but this time, someone is waiting. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood. Hardcore horror fans should all appreciate the cunning of Tina Shepard in the seventh installment of Friday the 13th. Tina accidentally drowned her father in Crystal Lake by using her special abilities of telekinesis. She comes back to Crystal Lake many years later with her mother and a psychiatrist, Dr. Bad News Cruz. Secretly, Tina tries to revive her dad from Crystal Lake only to bring back our hockey mask friend instead. Jason has a field day killing off the many sinful young adults until he comes head to head with Tina. In fact, there is a point in the movie where Jason is so pissed, Tina telekinetically rips off Jason's hockey mask, that it looked as if he was going to speak his first words. It didn't quite happen. It was more of a grunt, but definitely Tina deserves a big nod for surviving camp blood. Number one, Laurie Strode in Halloween. You don't believe in the boogeyman. You should. I know this sounds so typical, but hands down, Laurie Strode is the ultimate final girl. But here's why. In the span of 40 years, Laurie's character evolved from the vulnerable teenager to the I'm going to kick Michael's ass mature woman. We first meet Laurie in 1978, and she checked all the boxes for the final girl movie trope. But facing Michael Myers, the epitome of all evil, and living to tell about it shook Laurie to the core. She eventually comes into her own and becomes obsessed with not just stopping Michael, but killing him for good. She didn't need Dr. Loomis's help anymore. It was all about being one step ahead of Michael and seeing her obsession all the way through to the end, the ultimate final girl material. Although there's been criticism that slasher horror is rooted in misogyny, the evolution of the final girl is about bringing forward a strong, relatable protagonist that we can all ultimately root for, no matter the gender. Popular horror movies tend to appeal to men and women equally. Therefore, it's critical that horror writers continue to consider female protagonists that are beyond just a pretty face and knows how to scream really well. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Not in my movie. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Things That Go Bump in the Night. I'll be back soon. Thank you for listening.